Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth. Not too long ago, my son, who was just up here giving me a hug, uh, my son and I watched the animated Christmas movie called The Star. And I love watching films about the Bible because I like to see how closely or loosely the producers follow the real narrative in scripture. So as my kid and I snuggled to hear the Christmas story through the eyes of a cartoon donkey, I was paying attention to the movie's portrayal of angels. Angels appeared in a shimmering vortex of light. There was no human form in this rendition. They had these wing-like, wispy, sparkling threads shooting out from their sides, and the voice that emanated from the light was a rich male baritone. As I watched, I wondered, how do you picture angels? How do you picture angels? Do you imagine them as vortexes of light? Or as chubby little cherub babies with wings? I ask because angels play an important role, as you saw, in the Christmas story today. God sends enough angels to fill the sky, Scripture tells us and how we picture what they looked like in that moment affects how we understand the Bible's Christmas message. A couple of years ago, my wife was rummaging through some of the forgotten items in her mother's basement, and she sent me a photo of this little glass charm that she found hidden away in a cardboard box. It was in the shape of an angel with gold-plated wings, at its back and a halo on its head, not unlike what we saw today. And it had these flowing jewels, flowering jewels around its waist. Attached to it was a limerick prayer to a guardian angel. I think I may go out and see the world today, so keep me safe and sound, I pray. I may see another day. The guardian angel is one of the most famous cultural motifs of the Western world around Christmas time, the University of Chicago tells us that more than two-thirds of the public believe in angels. Those who believe may, like my wife, hang that charm on their rearview mirror in the car. When I asked her what she liked about this angel, she said that she liked that it was a prayer to keep her safe. Angels are protective figures in our imaginations and in popular culture, and in scripture. So we must be on to something here with the whole guardian angel thing. And yet, the ways we imagine angels are sometimes incongruent with the idea of them being protectors, right? For instance, everybody loves the chubby baby cherubs. But when was the last time a chubby baby saved you from a car crash? I'd prefer a Christmas elf with a crowbar over that kind of angel, I think, in that moment. And I don't think the ancients were so different uh, in what they desired in their angelic saviors. My guess is that the chubby babies weren't the ones flying in the air over Jesus' manger. And that's because Scripture calls these angels today a heavenly host. A heavenly host. Now, you and I might use the term host to describe someone who throws a party. But that's not what the word means, at least not in the biblical languages, and actually not even in English. So the word host comes to us in English from medieval Latin, and it means a stranger or a potential enemy. The word host is connected to the word for army. Army. I don't think there was a crowd of chubby cherubs or butlers with bow ties and long-tailed coats at the first Christmas. That angelic host was much more likely an army of strange, heavenly creatures. Some ancient accounts of cherubs say that they had four heads, three of which were animal-like, and that their bodies were covered in eyes and their legs were like wheels, as though God gave them built-in chariots for feet. So if the cherubs were there, they were a lot stranger even than chubby baby angels. Some of you um, may have seen the guards at the coronation of King Charles this year. 
There's this tradition of armed guards present the moment a king is made. And this goes back much further than Charles in our history books. And I think that's the tradition that these angels at Jesus' birth come from. The heavenly host were a supernatural sign of military support to back the newborn king born in the inn with no vacancy at Bethlehem. And the angels scripture describes as God's guardians are actually called seraphs in scripture. They're depicted as having multiple wings and their name in Hebrew means burning. The angels in the sky above Jesus' manger were likely not cherubs, but seraphs, the guardians. And this is also connected to Greek mythology. The king god Zeus had multiple winged guiding spirits that were guarding his throne. Their names were force, strength, victory, and zeal. Legend says that in one hand, the angel of zeal, whose name is Zelos, holds fire, and in the other, an invincible sword. Now that's an angel. The word zeal shows up in today's traditional Christmas reading twice. The word in Hebrew means to burn. And in Greek, it's onomatopoeia, and it mimics the sound of boiling water. Zah, oh. We just heard the word zeal read in our passage from the prophet Isaiah. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will establish and uphold the authority of the child who has been born for us. That's what Isaiah says. And I wonder if the zeal in this instance is less a description of emotion and more a description of an angel. Because the prophet says that endless peace will be established and upheld by the zeal, by the zealous of the Lord of hosts. Isaiah's prophecy describes God as this general of an angelic army whose enemy is injustice, whose enemy is conflict whose enemy is oppression and burden. God's light is said to transform dark conflict into justice, peace, and righteousness by God's fiery army. The angels of Christmas are an army of guardians present to preserve the peace this newborn king brings into the world. Does that change the Christmas story for you just a little bit? For me, it does. It loses, I'll admit, a little bit of the sentimentality that the chubby cherubs bring. But if flaming winged guards were there the night Jesus came into this world, that would convince me if I were a shepherd that a king had just been born. I would want to go see that sight. A host of strange beings armed for battle would certainly assure me that anyone who was against the peace that God desired would have a hard time winning that battle. The angel, these angels tell me that God intends to see that plan for peace through until the end. But if these angels, as they likely were described in scripture, don't really do you right for Christmas, I get it. And if you still want a little bit of sentimentality, I have some for you. I said that word zeal shows up two times in today's traditional readings. The second is in the epistle. And it doesn't refer to angels when it talks about zeal, but you and me. This book of Titus tells us that the followers of Jesus are to be zealous for good deeds, fiery for good deeds. And I think that that means that you and I are called to do our part to aid the heavenly hosts who are on earth to ensure the Prince of Peace becomes king of this world. And the way we do our part is through good deeds for others. And perhaps that's why doing good deeds is a central part of the Christmas season. So thank you for the good deeds that you do, for those of you who buy gifts for families in need or serve those who are homeless a Christmas meal. In this season, every time you choose to be kind to someone who cannot repay you, you become a kind of guardian angel yourself, joining the heavenly host in the protection of peace until one day Jesus' kingship is recognized by all the world 
and there will no longer be need for armies or angels or soup kitchens or gift donations because peace on earth will have finally come for all.